Welcome to a special virtual edition of the Skeptics Track at DragonCon, where we put the science in science fiction. Hello and welcome to our live streaming SkepTrack for DragonCon 2020. I'm Dr. Angie, I'm your assistant director. Uh, I am so excited. We are, we are all excited about our next guest, our guests. Uh, with us today, uh, Jamie Ian Swiss, who has been a regular on the Skeptic Track and is one of our favorites. But the he's going to be having an interview with Leo Igwe, who we are just tickled pink that we could have come speak. That's one of the benefits of the pandemic is folks who we couldn't ordinarily get here, we can actually have live interviews with. So uh, Jamie and Leo, Thank you so much for joining us on the Skeptic Track today. Hi, Angie. Thanks for having me. And Leo, it's a pleasure to see you. And I am absolutely as delighted as Andy indicated to be able to uh, talk with you today. Yeah. Thanks, Angie, for having me. Oh, can't, I can't tell you how happy we are. Jamie, take it away. Thanks so much. So, Leo, um, we have a number of things in common, I'm pleased to say, and uh, one of them is that we were both fellows of the James Randi Educational Foundation and that we both spoke at the 2012 TAM, the amazing meeting, although if my memory serves correctly, I don't think we crossed paths. Um, okay. I usually tend to be really busy at those things backstage and behind yeah. the scenes besides speaking. Um, did did you did you encounter me at, at any time that year? Well, I cannot recall right now because uh, you know at that meeting we have many people. I don't know how many how many people we used to attend by year. And maybe you can help me. But right. the hall the hall was full and there were so many parallel sessions. Exactly. So I can't recall, but yeah. How was your yeah. how was your experience how was your experience at TAM though? I believe that was your first time in the states, correct? Yeah, yeah, it was my first time at time and first time in the States. So um, it was um, it was very exciting because uh, uh, back here in Nigeria, we don't used to have that kind of space where mm -hmm. people can openly cast out uh, at paranormal beliefs. And here we do it with a lot of caution. Uh, but yeah, it was fun. It was educative. It was entertaining. And yeah, I, I enjoyed that experience. Good. I'm glad. I'm glad to know that. So um, I want to, before we get deeper into your work, uh, and you are a humanist and, an, and a humanist activist in Africa, battling among other things contemporary claims of witchcraft. And before we get deeply too deeply into that, I just want to touch on your personal history a bit. And by the way, I have a load of questions here, so I hope we can get to them. Uh, I'm sure we could fill the whole hour with just two or three, but we'll we'll see if I can move. We can both move through a bunch of them, but. You began your education in seminary with the intent of being a Catholic priest. And in your TED Talk, you say, quote, something happened while I was studying in the seminary and training to be a priest. So what happened along the way that you ended up a humanist? And not, let's not mince words here, not just an activist for the scientific worldview, but explicitly for atheism. Uh, well, the thing, what happened was that um, my outlook started to change. And um, I came face to face with the fact that religion was man-made. Because as we are growing up, we're always made to understand that, um, yeah, there is somebody out there and um, who is always in touch with us, monitoring us, and we need to be behave in line with what the person says. So, but I think in the course of my seminary training, I, I just found out shockingly that, yeah, initially, this must be made up. This must be something some people made up. And I was outraged that people could make up such a thing, maybe for a year, for a decade, for a century, for over a thousand years, and they could just take it outside their own society, outside their own continent, and to the rest of the world. So I, I was shocked at what I call um, the, if not the falsehood, but the deceit at the root of religious institution and religious worldview. And so it's, it wasn't that you were, came up a true believer and then somehow had some uh, uh, sudden insight, but really you were, it sounds like you were 
almost intuitively skeptical from the beginning. Is that right? Or very early on? Yes, in the sense that actually as we are growing up, you are not given an option either to be or not to be in terms of a believer or, or being a skeptic. No. I, I mean, as soon as I started thinking for myself and I began to reason, it was like, that's what you have to, you have to believe. So there was no option. So growing up was a, a kind of um, a, an opportunity for me to explore and uh, sit back and look at what I've been told and what I was told to follow. So there was no option. So that's it. That's it. So you, you, you eventually grow up claiming to be a believer. But of course, as you as one grows, you have to now own what you have been told, what you have been um, right. the way you have been told to, to behave and believe. So it was in the process of trying to ask myself, now what I've been told to believe, should I believe it? Am I really convinced? And that issue started coming up and I found out that they were not adding up. And uh, there was a lot of confusion because uh, we have Christian belief, we have uh, Islamic belief, we have traditional belief. So as you are growing up, you are confronted with so many religions that are claiming to be true. <laughs> So you can't know but ask questions. How can these different religious uh, belief systems that do not agree, how can they all be true? <laughs> and sometimes right. they use violence, they use force, and they use all sorts of means to coerce you to keep believing even when you have doubts or when you disbelieve. Yes, well, Richard Dawkins says, you know, of all the different gods, claims for gods in different religions, there's only two possibilities, either one of them is real or none of them are real. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, yeah. So uh, forgive me, I want to provide, uh, take a moment here to provide a little context to my, to my next question. Um, you know, the skeptic movement here in the, <clears throat> in the, in the United States uh, and in the West in general began, the modern skeptic movement began with a focus on paranormal claims like phony psychics and, uh, you know, pseudosciences like astrology and then expanded into uh, medicines, alternative, so-called alternative medicines like acupuncture and chiropractic and things like that. But if we go back in history, um, a classic Elizabethan text published in 1584 called The Discovery of Witchcraft by Reginald Scott, which coincidentally not only is a classic Elizabethan text, but also is the first book to ever uh, explain magic tricks in English as a small chapter about magic. But it was not a book about magic. It was actually a book in 1584 intended to debunk witchcraft. Now, okay. the author, Reginald Scott, he did not, he wasn't an atheist. He, he, he was sort of a free-minded uh, Christian. Christian of sorts. He did not yeah. um, completely declaim the existence of witches, but... I consider the book a classic of skepticism because he what he was doing was was he was questioning the evidence that was being used to to burn literally burn women at the stake. Now, yeah. um, so to bring this to, to up to date to your work, it could be surprising to discover here in the West that if we're going to talk about important skeptic issues of concern to African countries in the 21st century, it seems like witchcraft is one of the most primary and damaging concerns. I've read that in two Niger Delta states alone, Aqua, Ibam, and Cross River, there have been hundreds of documented cases of children being beaten, burned, beheaded, doused in acid or boiling water, poisoned or buried alive. It's horrifying for me to even be saying these words as I say them to you. So can you expand on this for us? And what do you think about the fact that in 2020, claims of witchcraft have been among your greatest concerns and focus points as a skeptic now for uh, at least a decade, if not more. Well, the, the issue of witchcraft intersects with health management, how people understand uh, health issues, how they explain the cause of diseases. Because before the introduction of what we call the orthodox medicine, people have re relied on herbal concoctions and rituals. And with these rituals, traditional healers try to divine the cause and eventually the cures for ailments. So, belief in 
supernatural, spiritual cause, causes of illness, they predate colonialism and they predate the con contacts with Western Christianity or Arabic Islam. So, but what happened is that now when these, um, when uh, the colonialists introduced what we call the Western medicine or what we call, or I prefer to call it evidence-based medicine or modern medicine as the case may be, um, it also came with Christianity. So Christianity and Western medicine, they came up with this in the same package. So that while the colonial establishment tried to prohibit witch finding or with the use of witchcraft narrative in making sense of health issues and in explaining misfortune, colonial missionaries were also introducing Christianity that, uh, that also was promoting exorcism, demonization of the causes of illness, and sometimes of death. So what happened is that uh, what the colonial officers removed in terms of witchcraft, the missionaries replaced it. So at the end of the day, when, at the end of uh, the colonial era, we had this kind of um, a, a mixture whereby uh, some people also continue to believe that there is a supernatural explanation of ailment. And within this supernatural explanation, many of them bought into what you call the witchcraft explanation because in the Christian Bible, Exodus 22, 18, it says, suffer not a witch to live. So right. a lot of people connected traditional belief in witchcraft with Christian belief in witchcraft, which came with colonialism. So today, it is difficult to tackle the issue of witchcraft and the witch persecution without having some issues with Christianity and Christian teachings. So and this I think is how, yeah. I think people in the West would be surprised. I think people in the West might assume if you hear about witchcraft and killing and torturing children in Africa, I think a, a, the mistaken assumption might be that this has to do with pre-industrial tribal uh, beliefs and religion and so forth. But in fact, this is fundamentally connected with Christianity in Africa. Yes, exactly. There is a fundamental connection and link with Christianity when it comes to witchcraft as it's manifest in contemporary Africa. And a lot of research has been done in Ghana, in Nigeria, that, sh that this research shows that the witch hunters now are not only traditional healers, but they are pastors or Christian prophets, ministers. Right. They are the one now that are championing this violent campaign of witch hunting and witch persecution. Exactly, and let's talk about that a little more because when when you say that you're you're battling witchcraft, what you're often battling in your case is so-called witch hunters, and uh, yes. this, I think the equivalent here in the West that we would be more familiar with would be faith healers in the in the yeah. Christian church, right? Yes. Who are widely yes. known and often exposed to be con artists who take yes. money. Uh, mm -hmm. for phony claims, for paranormal claims, which is the ability yeah. supposedly to heal people. And there's a long history of this in the West. So it's a similar thing there in Africa, except that it's focused on witchcraft. And it's these kind of phony uh, con artist Christian ministers and Christian ministries that are really promoting this whole idea of witchcraft, right? Yes. Yes, so when you are dealing with witch persecution, witch hunting here, you are dealing with faith healing because um, witch persecution takes place within the context of faith healing because many of these witch hunters, pastors, imams or malams, so it's not just Christian, it's also Islamic. There is an Islamic angle to it. So many of them claim to have the powers to heal through spiritual means. And in trying to exercise these spiritual healing powers, so-called spiritual healing powers, they indulge in witch persecution, they indulge in what they call exorcism, 
In fact, at the moment, we are battling with a Muslim witch hunter in central Nigeria. Hmm. And um, yes, and so you mentioned also that, that Islam has increasingly become a part of this as, as well. He says that, Is, you know, he... he, he uh, I'm kind of losing your connection there for a moment. Yeah, um, sorry. When I when I get a call, the, when I get a call, the oh, I the, see, the link goes I see. Off. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Pick up, pick up on what you go back to what you were saying, please, about uh, the the yeah. recent uh, is Islamic activities in this uh, area. You were yes. you were speaking about the, what I was saying was that role. yes, we are battling right now a Muslim witch hunter in central Nigeria. His name is Hassan Patigu. Now, he came to this area claiming to heal. He said he has a power to heal. And that um, uh, Prophet Muhammad had inspired him to come and heal the people. So what he does is to use sachet water, throwing it at people he identified as witches. In fact, he has gone to the extent of bringing those people out flogging them and forcing them to go around naked, all in, in the name of trying to exorcise witchcraft. So we see witchcraft exorcism today taking place within the framework of Islamic and Christian practices. So and is, if we are, yeah. Is, that, is this a part, I, I, this is my first, so the connection between Christianity, uh, the Christian church and, and witchcraft goes goes back obviously centuries um, yeah. but it's my first encounter with Islam doing the same kind of thing with right the idea of a Muslim uh, as you say exorcism is is yeah. this a recent phenomenon is this unique to Africa is this people just adapting to to these particular issues and and exploiting them recently? Well, I think that it is not a recent phenomenon, but it is not. It has not been very visible. This is it has been going on underground, because there are different sects in Islam, and some of these sects do not endorse, you know, some of these practices. But what happens is that when people are in need, when they have problems, when they are sick for a very long time, and they cannot find cures or remedies, they go That's to right. some of these. Malams, and who recommend? I visited a Malam who who told me that um, uh, my child was a witch because the child used to uh, cry at night and used to talk in the dream and all that. So when you go to them and explain your problems, uh, particularly some ailments, they can recommend certain rituals, and they include writing verses of the Quran and washing those things off and giving it to the person to drink. So they, they, there is both Islamic and the Christian layer of exercising witchcraft. And these are going on in contemporary Africa at the moment. Yeah, and of course this is standard with, Amer with uh, alternative medicine. Uh, alternative medicine often focuses on uh, chronic illnesses, that there are no easy treatments for chronic pain, things like this, things that you can get momentary relief from, uh, and, but that doesn't really go away. And whenever you look at any kind of marketing scam here in the West of, uh, for alternative medicine, it's always starting out, do you have these kind of symptoms? Do you have chronic pain? Do you have blah, 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 blah. And it's the same thing that you see at a at a faith healing, for example, is you might get um, a little bit of, you know, some temporary relief just from the emotion of the moment of the situation and so on, uh, or the placebo effect, uh, and then it, it doesn't last. And that's always been the foundation of, uh, of a lot of alternative medicine. I mean, uh, homeopathy is a billion dollar business here in the West, a billion dollar business annually uh, for people buying uh, sugar water and sugar pills that literally do nothing um, yeah. and uh, you know they're they're convinced imagine imagine what we could accomplish if we spent that money on things that were real and, and evidence based yeah and evidence based now now along with uh, what you're talking about in terms of chasing these people 
in a particular case, uh, you have been for years chasing Helen Okbabio, and she yeah. is one of these uh, witch hunters who is highly litigious and has filed countless lawsuits against you, ostensibly for libel and supposedly claiming uh, that you're attacking her so-called freedom of worship, her freedom yeah. to believe in, in witchcraft. Um, and I even read a new story about her continuing attempts to legally harass and silence you um, as recently yeah. as July. Uh, yes. So can you, can you tell me a little bit about this? This must, this must be a very expensive project to keep defending yourself. Yes. Um, well, Helen is one of uh, uh, Nigeria's most notorious witch hunters. And uh, she claims to be an ex-witch. And um, now she has the power to identify and exercise witchcraft. And um, I have also tried to use my programs to send a message to her that what she's doing belongs to the past, to the past in terms of humanity, in terms of history, and is in conflict with everything that is known to be human and humane in terms of human rights, uh, in terms of uh, science, critical thinking, education, and enlightenment. Yeah, but you see, she has been, um, she has been very upset by our campaign. And she right. has been doing everything to undermine efforts we are making to educate and enlighten the public. You see, anytime people, Nigerians, a critical mass of people in this part of the world begin to understand that witchcraft is superstition, they begin to, they begin to disbelieve in witchcraft, I think that Helen Okwabio will lose her market and will lose her political base. In fact, she founded a church with the sole mission to exorcise witchcraft. So, of course, that will be the end of the church. So, I think that she is feeling threatened by the efforts we are making and by the progress we are making. And she's trying to use these litigations and lawsuits to silence me and to, and to shut down our campaign efforts. And can I ask, is it the humanist uh, groups that you're involved with uh, in Africa that are, that are financing your defense, that are, that are helping to battle these legal cases? Well, I think that the, the humanist uh, movement has um, expressed their support because uh, I'm still waiting for the court to serve me the process. The lawyers have not served. They just sent me a letter. Uh, so I'm waiting for the court process to, to start. But um, uh, the humanist and the atheist movements have um, indicated that um, if I need any support, that they will be ready to assist me. So. Uh, it is with their support now that uh, I think I'll be able to continue my work and campaign without getting worried of uh, maybe getting um, spending, getting bankrupted by lawsuits from uh, Helen That's Park. good. So, so even though she keeps suing you and so on, she's not prevailed in any court to date? No, she has not. She has not. In fact, the first time she tried it, she lost. So, and I think uh, she will still lose again. So, um, if, if I may, and this is a bit of an uncomfortable area, but I think it's worth addressing. Um, in a way, Leo, you are a stranger in your own land. The social science indicates that Africa is uh, the most religious region on the planet. And despite the fact that you were born in Nigeria, humanism is invariably an uphill climb, a worldview faced with deeply entrenched resistance. And in your manifesto for skeptical Africa, you wrote, I quote your own work here, an African who thinks critically or seeks evidence and demands proofs for extraordinary claims is accused of taking a, quote, white or Western approach. An African questioning local superstition and traditions is portrayed as having abandoned or betrayed the essence of African identity. Skepticism and rationalism are regarded as Western un-African philosophies, close quote. And the year that you were at TAM, there was a magazine article where the reporter um, observed, he said, uh, during the talk, Igwe displays a picture of a, a uh, sorry, a Ghanaian man, Ghanaian man inside a thatched roof hut performing a traditional soothsaying ritual with seashells. And as he pauses on the image, Igwe declares, friends, these are the fakers. He uses cowries, that's shells, 
and throws them on the ground and is staring at them as if there's something he is seeing. And Igwe's voice rises in pitch. I'm reading from the magazine here. Pitch, volume, and tempo. And he continues in an exasperated tone. He is seeing nothing. It's fake. And believe me, I sympathize. I've done the same thing myself countless times. Um, but here's, the, here's my question. The reporter then says, there are a few chuckles in the audience, but mostly silence, as if no one is quite sure how to balance their skeptical instincts against their cross-cultural sensitivities. The soothsayer may well be a charlatan, but only Igwe has the right to ridicule him, close quote. The reporter's observation is uh, undeniably astute. Can you comment about this kind of issue? Well, the thing is that I think there are so many layers in this issue. First of all, indeed, um, indeed. Yeah, there are so many things, and we, we, we can pack them slowly. Um, the, the idea that um, maybe if one is African, when you question how people react in this part of the world, yeah, they try to identify uh, the person, they think that you are playing West or you are, you are, you are acting like a white person. Yes, that is. It is, a, it is a kind of response I get sometimes here. And, um, but it does, it, it does not mean that people don't question here. Now, the question, but there isn't a lot of social capital in openly questioning. Yes. It's, instead, there is more capital in privately questioning, but openly presenting yourself as if you are not questioning, you are believing. That is why all the all the, the statistics, the religious demographics in Africa, they're all bloated, they are fake, they are bogus. Because they are they include people who are privately skeptical, as skeptical right. as I am. The only difference is that they are not open and public with it because of cost, because of consequences, and because of right. the price. Yes. Right. So a, a lot of people will agree with me that the, the man throwing around cowries and claiming to be seeing something, you know, they will agree with me that the man wasn't seeing anything. He was just playing a game to get me part with my money. But they may not be able to put their face publicly on such segments. Yes. Because they think that at the end of the day, they could be threatened, they could be harassed. Of course, they could get lawsuits like uh, the ones I'm getting from Helen, you can get threats from uh, followers of some of the popular uh, paranormalists and the prophets and pastors, and uh, because they will threaten you, and um, if your family will also want you to stay away from doing all sorts of things, because if they don't, if they cannot target and kill you, they might target and kill your family and all that. So due to fear, intimidation, due to the cost of skepticism, Many Africans have chosen to present themselves as they, that they are believers or they, they subscribe to paranormal. Meanwhile, they don't because in their private conversation, they question the doubt. And this has been used to represent or misrepresent Africa and Africans. And, and it, there seems to be this impression that there is no skeptics or there, is, there are few skeptics. There are right. skeptics here. But the price of skepticism is very high. And we are working very hard to make sure that it's not so high again and that people begin to voice out their belief, voice out their questions, voice out their doubts without you know, being so conscious, without censoring themselves so much. Because that is actually the challenge we have in this part of the world. It's very, very interesting. So uh, really, uh, as, as much as you are battling this specific uh, enemies, if you will, of reason, these uh, witchcraft hunters and so on, in some ways, it's almost uh, your bigger battle, and perhaps even in some ways your more significant battle towards the future is, to, is against culture, is to try and create or recreate a culture where skepticism is, can be more open and the scientific worldview can be more openly embraced by the common the common citizenry as well as governments yes yes it is yes it is because is there, if you can if one could say that it is it is more or less a subculture is a covert kind of manifestation and expression but that is not doing africa and africans any good 
Number one is reinforcing this idea that Africans are mentally wired to magic and uh, witchcraft and occultism, which actually is not exactly the case. Yes, a lot of Africans are skeptical. A lot of Africans are doubtful. Uh, a lot of Africans question uh, miracles. If you go online today, the internet has opened the space for many Africans to question some of this openly, which they were not questioning before. So I think that at the end of the day, it's, it's, a, it's a cultural war or battle. It is a battle between dogma and reason. It's a battle between being open without skepticism versus being private and speaking in harsh tones. And some people will tell you, look, I don't believe in God, but I don't have the courage to say it the way you are right. saying it. It is all about nurturing that courage, the courage to speak critically of religion and paranormal views, the courage to disbelieve, to courage to express your doubts. So it is, that is what it's all about at the moment. The, the, the people are skeptical, Africans are skeptical, but we need to get that, you know, uh, enthroned and cultivated in a way that it becomes something open and it becomes something people can publicly identify with, with little or no consequences. Yeah, well, this is not unique to Africa at all, of course. Uh, Richard Dawkins uh, always spoke in his uh, atheist activism, uh, likening, likening his approach to the movement to that of the progress, the progress that gay rights made by just being out, by people willing to say, I am this, I am an atheist so that yeah. your neighbors become more aware yeah. that they are yeah. living among you. They are living among yeah. you every day, uh, yeah. regardless, including that you're, in your case, that there are skeptics and people who are uh, pro, who support a scientific worldview and who are, yeah. who are constantly among you. But you have to try yeah. and shift the culture and encourage people to speak up and identify yeah. themselves. Yeah. Is, does so this, does is, this vary? Would you, would you say this varies uh, in parts of regionally in the continent or with particular countries? Some that are more conservative, religious, some are more progressive, or? Yeah, I, I think that you see there are so many dynamics at play depending on where you find yourself. Like, in, I must tell you that there is this kind of, um, um, should I call it either hegemonic or domino effects, religious domino effects. And by, that, by this I mean, Christianity and Islam, they used to, they, they, they react differently to skepticism and questioning attitudes. And uh, people who find themselves, like in Nigeria, in the Christian dominated past, you see them be more expressive, more open with their skepticism. Unlike those who find themselves in, uh, in the Northern part or the Muslim dominated areas, we have people are, are made to only identify publicly with anything that is with, with positions that are consistent with Islam. So I think that uh, for us in Nigeria, in the Muslim dominated part, uh, skepticism is, um, has a higher price compared to areas in the South where people are freer to express their minds, debate, and discuss, agree and disagree, and express their doubts with um, minimal you know, consequences, comparatively speaking. So I think that um, uh, the influence, the connection with Islam and Christianity is also a factor in deciding the extent that people express themselves openly in terms of their skepticism or critical thinking. Like, like I just want to say that if you are, if you are to be very critical, in Nigeria, you, you, you have to be sure you are not critical of something that Islam has endorsed if you are in the Muslim-dominated areas. And uh, because of the totalitarian nature of the Islamic religion, many right. people who are critical there find it difficult, more difficult compared to those in the Christian-dominated areas where they are freer to express their doubts. And uh, some, for instance, their position when it comes to evolution uh, versus Christianity, you see people being very free to express their thoughts along this line if they are in the southern part than if they are in the northern part where we have uh, Islam. So Islam and Christianity, there are factors when it comes to the extent between Africans express 
their skeptical rationalist views. Interesting. Uh, now, while you are battling witchcraft, which in the West we like to think of as an issue from 400 years ago that's no longer of modern concern, but when you talk about this culture war, if you will, this battle between, as you put it, uh, reason and dogma, uh, if I may ask, what's your perspective on the current state of affairs in the United States in terms of critical thinking and religiosity and the increasing socio-political and economic divisions in American culture and politics. Would you care to comment? Could you hear me? Did you hear my question? Leo? Did we lose him? Yes, I think I... I lost you a bit, yes. I lost you a bit, the second part of your question. Ah, ah, ah. So what I was going to ask you is when you're talking about a culture war, and as you put it, the, the battle between reason and dogma, yeah. what, is your, what is your perspective on the current uh, state of affairs in the United States in terms of critical thinking and religiosity and uh, divisions in American culture and politics? Would you care to comment? Yeah, you see, I... Especially nowadays, I'm always very careful uh, when it comes to commenting on American issues. I'm sure you understand. Um, first of all, um, I'm not an American and I, I have very little knowledge of what goes on there. But it is important to let Americans understand that how they go about this culture war enhances or hampers what is going on in, in other parts of the world. Yes, we have to be realistic. We have to face reality. America, a lot of people around the world look up to America. They want to know what's going on in America. If the president begins to talk to journalists carelessly, roughly, a lot of politicians begin to do the same thing in other places. If a, if a president begins to uh, come out and um, make pronouncements that are incompatible with science, Immediately, people begin to repeat and replicate such right. propositions as well. So, and uh, if, the, if the president in America says people should be taking the toll if they, ha if they have COVID-19, let me tell you, before 10 or 20 Americans have taken the toll, hundreds in Nigeria have taken it, or chloroquine, or whatever, or whatever, whatever is being said about how to go about managing COVID-19 and other issues. So I want to make it clear that losing and winning the culture war in other parts of the world has some connection with what is going on in the U.S. And it is yes. important that U.S. understands this and, um, and not, you know, and, and sit up and, and really, you know, uh, present themselves as a role model because if uh, people begin to uh, adopt paranormal positions because of the pronouncements of American presidents, then that sends a wrong message. That sends a wrong message to the whole world. Yes, because many people look at America as a model. Yes, well, of course, people should be free not to blindly follow American models and all that. But we have to face the reality that many people look to America whenever they want to whenever they need guidance in terms of what they do. So when American, pres American president or American politicians continue to promote paranormal beliefs, many people in other parts of the world you know, tend to follow such beliefs. And they tend to, uh, in fact, demonize or undermine any other efforts being made to challenge such positions. So simply, what I would say is this. Um, there are culture wars going on across the world, but what is going on in America has a way of enhancing or undermining what is going on elsewhere. So it is important that those who understand the, the, the influence that American experience, American situation could have on other parts of the world should be careful and make sure that they don't you know, issue or make very reckless statements thinking that they could get away with uh, they can get away with it because of political expediency. They should know that it has a lot of impact, not only on America, but on culture wars going on elsewhere. 
Well, I'm glad I asked you the question because it's an excellent answer. And of course, there are many here who agree with you and uh, many who are horrified at the fact that we have an anti-science government uh, right now in Washington uh, and that also that uh, America has been a world leader in, as you say, in many areas of thought uh, from, from international policy to just things like questions of science uh, post-World War II and that when, and now we have a, an unfortunate experiment that when you abandon that leadership, it leads to, to chaos in many ways and in many places because that leadership of thought is in many ways as significant as the need for leadership and action so uh, I, I agree with your observation, and I thank you for that, for those comments. Um, so here's, a, uh, here's an odd question for you, and I suspect I may be the first to mention this to you. Um, but uh, in the March issue of Genie Magazine, Genie Magazine is the, I'm a professional magician, and Genie's, Genie Magazine is, the world's leading independent magic magazine. And in March, there was a cover story about a, uh, a professional uh, magician, a, a woman named Lisa Mena, who in the last few years retired from her professional work here in the United States, created a nonprofit organization called Cause to Wonder. And she has been active, uh, well, in a number of different places from, I think she started in working in Papua New Guinea, but is now mostly active in Africa, working on women's rights and violence against women and so forth. And so um, she says, I'm going to quote her for a moment and then I'll expand on this for you because I, I imagine you have not heard about this. Uh, if you have, if you have, let me know. But <clears throat> so she says, she uses magic to engage people and to put across new ideas. And she says, I'm a magician. Sometimes I go into a jungle in a village in Africa where women are bought and sold in exchange for pigs. Perhaps I, I just make a rock disappear. And then I whisper, if you let girls go to school, the village will be lucky. And then I leave. I'm doing magic tricks and I'm using these magic words and I'm hoping people will repeat them. That's a close quote, but now I'll go to the reporter's Observation. So the reporter says, repetition will lead to superstition. Superstition will lead to belief, perhaps, in parts of the world where belief is what drives action. Cause to Wonder's main project aims to change prevailing attitudes about domestic violence. The goal is to embed in the public consciousness a simple idea that helping women brings good things. And... They, the reporter adds that the message seeks to, that uh, Cause to Wonder seeks to spread also makes it crucial for Lisa Mena to dissuade her audience of the idea she is some kind of shaman or witch or healer. She doesn't claim that at all, but using these sort of magic words, is, she does talk in terms of sort of creating a superstition that hopefully will, will carry and get repeated to try and break the pattern of attitude towards women. I, I realize this is probably the first you've heard of this movement, but what do you think about this? Because it's she's a, a contemporary activist, um, and yet there, she's dealing in a kind of replacement superstition, not religion, not claiming to be a shaman, not claiming that her what she's doing is, is real, that she has magic powers, but but on a deeper level, trying to sort of create a superstition to battle and try and transform cultural attitudes towards women in Africa. What's your initial th thought about this? Nonsense. Nonsense. Outright nonsense. You see, look, the problem I have with some Americans and uh, Westerners who come to Africa for, for, to experiment their whatever, you see their imaginations and fantasies, is that they have a way of reinforcing the stereotypes, misrepresenting situations. Look, part of the challenge we have heard is that there are these Americans who think they understand Africans more than any other person. And their work is to come back home and explain who Africans are. Right. This is a mistake we have made, okay? 
And I think that this woman belongs to that class of misguided, you know, uh, for, me, for me, disoriented. And if care is not taken, she's mentally sick, you know, to go around spreading this kind of narrative. Look, there is this idea that, oh, something, some re replaced superstition is going to help us in changing cultural attitude is outright blatant nonsense. And people who are peddling it, they don't deserve to be quoted. They don't deserve to be honored in any way. Look, if you want to change an attitude, what's, what attitude is that? You want a child to go to school, get, go to the people, make them understand that there's a scholarship, there, is a, uh, there are finances that can enable the, the child to grow, and make them understand that there are, there are benefits that are value adding, you know, uh, value adding opportunities for the girl. So all these things will help get people to take their, uh, uh, allow their other girls to go to school or, or they change their attitudes. The idea that, ah, we Africans, they need myth. They need superstitions for them to really uh, uh, adopt behaviors that Westerners take for granted. It's outright nonsense. I have been reading that in anthropological text. And today, things are changing. You are speaking with me here now. I am having the same internet. And I'm able to I'm able to log in and things like that. There isn't any ritual performed. The same way you signed in, you sent me the material. That's the way we I signed in. I'm able to, and anybody can connect, whether the person is in Papua New Guinea or is in America or anywhere. But some people, some some of your anthropologists will come here and said, Oh, yeah, but when it comes to Africa, you know, we need some rituals. You know, they are still, you know, trying to, you know, sell that that idea of Africans are there. As, as those petrified by the occult um, and that you cannot really make any meaningful progress unless you, you use the narratives of superstition, myth, and mysticism. I'm saying it is rubbish, nonsense completely. Set up schools. Set up as you have them in the United States. Connect them with societal growth. Make people understand that there are benefits in educating their children, male or female. They will educate them. You know, and stop selling this idea that continue to reinforce that notion of Africans as backward people and as magical people. So for me, what she has done is nonsense. It's completely an outright, stupid, crazy, baseless ideas. Those are narratives that people privilege in, in areas where people have not traveled and interacted. I have lived in the West, and I have, I'm also an African, and I can make comparisons. There are structures in, in Germany, in Europe, and America that are, not, that, are, that are not available here. Replicate those structures here. People will behave. We, human beings are the same. It's all about how we are cultured and cultivated. And if we're able to universalize all those structures, healthcare structure, scholarship structures, opportunities, you will find out that there is little or no difference between Africans in Papua New Guinea and uh, or Europeans and Americans. So that is it. But I'm happy that we are are going towards that world today. With the internet, with the connection of people, you know, through technology and all that, we can now not rely on the likes of this woman who thinks that she can always gain audience in America by selling this very misguided and mistaken idea of Africans and how attitudes can be changed in Africa. Very good, thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I'm very glad to hear your thoughts about that. Um, now, I've been a skeptic activist for, and I, I agree with you, uh, but I've been a skeptic activist for decades, for longer than I care to say. Uh, and yet I have always believed and often said that when there are people who are on the bottom rung under the foot of an inherently unfair economic system. And I'm not just talking about Africa now. I'm talking about, yeah. well, yeah. just yesterday, just yesterday, the magazine section of the Sunday New York Times had a cover story about hunger in America, so-called food insecurity. So to me, when people are on the bottom of an, un an inherently unfair system, it's very hard to tell them that everything you will ever accomplish for yourself and your family has to occur only in your own life and lifetime. We know that the church offers a second chance at salvation in the afterlife. And it's understandably a hard message to dissuade people who are starving. It's easy to talk about complicating factors like abject poverty in the third world, in Africa and Asia, for example. But again, we, have, we are facing hunger in America now. So, 
So how do you, what is, what is your thinking of years of activism of this? How do you talk people into a humanist worldview um, when the, the, they're trapped in a reality that is almost inescapable or appears in, to be inescapable? Yeah, well, the thing is that the idea of being inescapable is something that I trust to address because, because I don't think that, look at the history of humankind, we have always been escaping. Now, let me give you an example. When I started the humanist movement and tried to encourage skepticism, that was in the 90s, a lot of people felt that, you know, the movement will not grow because they looked at the situation with the realities of, the t of that time. Nobody foresaw the internet. Nobody. I'm talking about in my own part of the world in the 90s, in the 90s. I know that in the US is a different reality. But as I said, we were, we were, I was starting, nobody foresaw the impact that the internet was going to have in connecting people and in, in getting even knowledge. Today, you don't even need to go to libraries. You just need to look up things online and then you can write a paper even without stepping into physically into a library. Or even if you want to access books, you can access books just sitting on your laptop. So what I'm saying here is that, first of all, I will, I will take off by telling you that I have always told people that they, can, they are not found in a situation that are inescapable. We continue to escape, yes. But and it is important to give people some hope based, not, not, not the kind of hope of, uh, oh, you are going to escape by going into heaven and then, um, uh, we are in white cloth and enjoying forever with a spirit. That, that's nonsense. Cross the dots for them, historically speaking. And I can use my own life story. Yes, I wasn't, I wasn't born in a rich family. My, you know, my parents, my, my, my father was a teacher. My mother used to sell things in the local <coughs> market and all that. And I followed her to sell chicken and a few things in the local market. But here I am today. Okay? And I've been able to I've been able to have a first degree, second degree. I, I, I went for uh, my doctoral degree and all that. And, uh, and, and today, I look back and tell people, you can become, you can become who I am. You can, you can, you can also, well, if you are born in the village, you can end up being a, a skeptic uh, a leader, a humanist leader. You can also be, have, hold a doctoral degree. You can conquer poverty. You can overcome Tell me, the thing here is that this message, we must continue to emphasize this. People can overcome their situations. I do not buy into the situation because my life doesn't even tell me that people cannot overcome. No, I tell them, I want, I, I want to spend the, the next decades of my life going back to the primary school where I, I, where I started to tell them, I say, look, you can finish here, have a first degree, have your doctorate, come back and be a known person. Even, you can even be better than you know, what I am or become you know, something better than who I am at the moment. So it is always important to send a message of hope and change. Because philosopher Heraclitus says, the only reality we have is change. That's what's, that's what's going on. And look at it, that's the case. So it is important, like I said, we send a message that people are not condemned and damned you know, you know, to a particular situation that they can change it and they can change it using their own efforts and that their efforts can pay, give the people that sense of power they need, which they, they deny them by telling them that if there is an almighty who has all the power. Let's give it back to them and let's try. That is how humanity has always got, came out of the cave. That's how they, 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 they got implement. And that is why today we are going to mass. Humanity is going to mass already because we know we can always overcome. We can always move beyond that situation. For me, this is where the message starts. And with this, people are receptive to all your views, whether they are skepticism or critical thinking. Thank you. The wonderful insight uh, and perspective to, to present um, why humanism is the truly hopeful worldview and the optimistic worldview, uh, as opposed to trapping people in the sense of, uh, <clears throat> of uh, their in a supposed inability to escape the way people are trapped in, in religious beliefs and superstitious beliefs uh, that really uh, where the only 
the only method of escape that's given is an imaginary one, yeah. uh, as opposed to the real one that, as you say, your own life is a perfect uh, evidence of. Uh, so uh, just a little bit more on this, and as, we, as we're drawing to a close here, um, in your manifesto for Skeptical Africa, you wrote, charlatans operate out there in their communities. They mine popular fields, fears and anxieties, exploiting desperate, misinformed folks. Well, we see that in the United States, too. You say we need to expose them and free our people for the, for the, from their bondage. Um, in the TED Talk, you say, but we cannot accomplish all these goals by wishful thinking with our eyes closed or by armchair speculation or by expecting salvation from an empty sky, just as you were just saying. And also in the manifesto, you wrote, they need to be told that the skeptical goods the liberating promises of skeptical rationality are by far more befitting and more beneficent to uh, Africans than imaginary rewards, either in the here and now or in the hereafter. So I will ask, will exposing charlatans change the population's mind about their fundamental beliefs? And what do you propose and what do you see as the future for promoting the scientific worldview in Africa? And we have about three minutes. Okay, well, the thing is that will exposing uh, charlatans would that change people's view? I say yes. And again, it is important we, 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 we don't just shoot ourselves on the foot, you know, by saying, you know, by having this very gloomy, pessimistic outlook. I say yes. Now, let me give you an example. Uh, following the outbreak of COVID 19, one of the local pastors, and faith healers came out and said that he could heal COVID-19 patients. And he was asking the government to allow him into those isolation centers. Wow. Now, what I did, I challenged him. I told him, okay, I'll give you, I used the James Randi model to challenge this pastor. I said, okay, for every patient, I'll give you $1,000 if you can heal, just one patient. And at a point, he responded. I told him, okay, I will increase it to $5,000 for a patient. If you can heal one COVID-19 patient, get $5,000. And you know what happened? People, start, it was, that, that um, challenge trended. It was trending on social, it trended on social media uh, for days wow. and weeks. And people were now calling, people were asking, a lot of people were like, okay, yeah, you know, we know that the guy is a charlatan, this and that and that and that. So we start, people started having the discussion. For weeks, this was on. And now we have got to the past again. So if you ask me, will challenging them, will it change mind? I say yes. But you see, it is difficult to measure. But from my end, I will tell you that people will begin to ask questions. And the change comes when, you know, or could be stimulated by getting people to question beliefs they usually take for granted. So I think that there is a lot that will come if we begin to challenge them. Because a lot of people are tired. A lot of people are frustrated. And I get stories of people who say, look, yes, this guy exploited, this pet healer did this to me, this pastor did this to me, because they, they mind people's gullibility. So I think that minds will change. And now, do we have a challenge of promoting scientific outlook in Africa? Yes, we're going to have that challenge. But, but life is all about confronting challenges. Now, but when we think about it today, look at all we have gotten as a result of science, including the mechanism we are using to speak and interact today. Look at all the cures for, for diseases. We are, all, we are waiting for scientists. We are not waiting for paranormalists. We are not waiting for, right. for, for faith healers to provide the vaccines that can help us manage the pandemic. So, so what I'm saying, the hope still lies on promoting and, uh, and fostering and furthering the scientific outlook. So it is hard, but it is never easy. Yes, humankind has not gotten this far by doing things that are easy, but by doing things that are hard. So in the, this advancing scientific outlook is not going to be easy. It's going to be challenging, but there lies the hope, the real hope for African Renaissance, African emancipation, and humanity enjoying and making the best of this one life that we have. 
Well, I couldn't agree with you more, and I celebrate you, Leo, and I celebrate your work, and you are an inspiring, a truly inspiring example of the skeptical outlook and the scientific worldview at work, on the ground, uh, changing, changing the world. And it's a privilege to talk to you, and thank you so much for giving us this time today. Yeah, also thank you for having me. A pleasure, a pleasure. Angie? Oh, Jamie, I wish y'all could have gone on for two more hours. That was so, <laughs> I could too. watch y'all talk all day long. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining us. We were talking sort of behind the scenes, thinking, wow, this should be like an annual thing that, <laughs> <laughs> that we give y'all two hours every year to fight it out. I just, I love the points that you made, Leo. I really want to know what can we do? How can we help you in your fight? Tell us what we can do. No, no, no. You see, what you have done now is very important. Giving us a platform. I want to let you know that here in Nigeria, we don't have that platform. Hmm. Yes. Because a lot of people feel offended. Because at the end of the day, in promoting critical thinking, in promoting uh, scientific thinking, it, it will always have to do something with people's religious sensibilities. So they see you as somebody who will provoke or annoy or offend them. So we need platforms. That's what we need at Done. the moment. Done. Yes. So <laughs> and thank you for giving me this platform. And that's what we need. Because when we have this platform, we get our story out. We get more people to understand that, yes, that if you hold critical, if you hold critical views, if you uh, expose the scientific outlook, you are not uh, isolated. You are not quarantined. You are not uh, a kind of, um, um, how do you call it, somebody that is not allowed, you know, banished or something like that, treated as if you, you don't matter. So it is important, you know, we get platformed. We, we have uh, opportunities like this to speak. Let me just tell you this briefly. I, 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 I recently started a project of promoting critical thinking in schools. And I wrote, um, I wrote a book and, um, and a book series. So I gave that, I told one of my uh, relatives that ah, I have a book on critical thinking. Do you know the first, uh, her first reaction? Look, I hope it's not the one that will make people to question God. Okay? Now, she has not read the book. She doesn't know what is inside right. it. Oh. Okay? Good. So there is that bias. Okay? So with that bias, people don't give us audience. They don't give us platform. They don't give us, um, you know, we don't feel, you know, uh, needed in a society. Mm. So what you can do is to give us this platform. Let's begin the exchange. Because I know that people, they will come later. And when they know now, and they keep reading it out there, they keep seeing how pro the progress we are making, I think that a lot of people will begin to say, hmm, okay, yeah, but this guy is saying the truth. Ah, but yeah, there's something in this. I think we need to listen to him. Mm -hmm. So give us a platform. That's what most important for us. And uh, I think the rest we follow. Anytime, you know, anytime. And thank you, Jamie. How, where can we find you? Uh, <laughs> right now, well, you can find me here in San Diego, but actually... Uh, I'm doing virtual shows. I have, uh, I have a new show called The Impossible Show uh, that you can find out more about on my website. And I'm doing uh, some really fabulous... Uh, it's called The Impossible Show because all magic is impossible, but it seems even more impossible to do it across the great distances. But I've been doing private events and, and corporate events uh, over, uh, over things like Zoom and so forth where magic happens in people's own hands in their own home read people's minds so uh it's you know uh it's co a constantly changing world and uh it even affects magic oh well you don't have to read my mind to know how much i appreciate both of y'all being <laughs> here today so thank you so much and thank you for watching the live skeptic track streaming from dragon con 2020 uh thank you very much for joining us uh, guys and we will see you later bye y'all thanks angie as fun as all this streaming content is, we sincerely cannot wait to see you all in person again next year. Remember to stay healthy and safe until then. Wear a mask when interacting with other people out in the real world. Want more SkepTrack? Get more than 10 years of Skeptics Track programming at our video archive video.skeptrack.org